Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Energy in America on a given Wednesday at 3 p.m. with Lou Puglierisi, who joins us from Washington. He's the CEO of EPRINC, Energy Policy Research. And we are going to talk today about uh, Joe Biden's energy policy, which is really very important. He's, he's rolling out all his people and his ideas, and, and we see already some issues uh, you know, among, among the members of the Democratic Party who are interested in such things and it's going to have to settle down. So let's take a look with Lou Pugliarisi about what it looks like right now. But I'm sure there's plenty of material to come in the weeks and months to follow, Lou. Am I right? Absolutely. We're going to be very busy. We're going to be very busy <laughs> next year. <laughs> there's a lot going on, and uh, some of it is uh, very interesting, and some of it is probably of only of interest inside the Beltway. But we should get <laughs> Okay. We have, let's see what we can cover today. I thought what I'd like to do today is talk a lot about uh, uh, new administration and the transition to the fuels of the future. What does that mean? How, what's the degree of difficulty? Uh, what is the difference between the aspirational goals and the real world or the realities of the world? And I think at the same time, uh, I think the appointments in the whole national security area where energy environment will be a key, uh, a key feature is a very positive thing. Uh, the appointment of, uh, uh, let me see, Blinken, who was, uh, I think, uh, Deputy Secretary of State. So, he, and, uh, uh, and we can talk a little bit about John Kerry. I think that raises a lot of interesting, but Anthony Blinken is the new Secretary of State. He's very much in the tradition of the you know, bipartisan view of American foreign policy in the post-World War II era. Which is, we're a very big country, we're world power, we are the, the premier world power, but we have two big oceans on each side of us. And you cannot uh, operate as a superpower, world power without allies, right? It's just not possible. And whatever the problems our allies uh, give us from time to time, that alliance uh, network and relationship is key to so many things in American security and prosperity for the years to come. And uh, while you could argue some aspects of uh, the Trump administration uh, were not really misplaced in terms of the policy, the execution of it, and I think the style was very counterproductive. I think there's no doubt about that. And so. I think Biden sees his role as repairing, that's front and center for him. He's got a lot of other things going on. We can talk about it as we proceed, but. Uh, have, you, have you seen the, uh, the rollout of his uh, potential appointments, uh, including um, Anthony, um, uh, Anthony? Yeah, Blake, uh, and I think his, uh, Jake Sullivan as National Security Advisor. Yeah. In many ways, although these guys do have experience from the Obama administration, I actually don't think this is a repeat of Obama. I think yeah. this is uh, the stamp Biden is putting on that reflects his long, long experience in foreign policy and in Washington. And uh, I am not, I mean, I, I have certain concerns about energy policy and what's realistic and not, and not but I, this aspect of the administration is, in my view, extremely positive. So. Well, there's there, the comments they made only yesterday, all of them really were so touching. You know, um, I tell you, it, was, it really brought uh, tears to my eyes about, you know, the openness and the, the caring about the country um, and the, the willing, as you said, to do multi, multilateral engagement with our allies, this was, it was really fabulous. And there was a, some stories, uh, one Blinken story about his uh, grandfather and the American tank in the woods and how uh, he had run away from uh, a uh, death camp in the Holocaust and found this American tank with a star on the side, a white star. Yeah, and great. an African-American guy stood up uh, from the hatch in the tank and he looked at him, and the two were, you know, looking at each other. And this little boy, his grandfather, uh, looked at him and he gave him the only three words that he knew in English, which were "God bless America." <laughs> yeah, really I, I, actually, I believe I believe 
in these values in the American tradition and the pole. I mean, I get frustrated a lot of times with the millennials. I think they have a very lack of understanding of the post-World War II consensus and what that's about, but that, that's for another day. I think uh, one of the things though, is that uh, at some point, uh, people are gonna get smacked in the head with the reality of the world and uh, how they adjust to that is going to be very interesting. I can tell you, I have a lot of discussions with Japan every week. I think the Japanese are at one level a little apprehensive, but on the other hand, I think they understand that Japan is going to remain a, sort of the lodestar of US policy in the Asia Pacific region, which is absolutely essential for US. Well, you kind of alluded to it a minute ago, and I, I think it's worth mentioning that, that Trump's uh, departure um, actually is a time for reflection on policy. It's a time to evaluate and reevaluate and, and find new directions, especially on energy policy and environment policy. So we're in, we're in, a, we're in a, a very important time right now. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about how we look for, how, how we think about the transition to the fuels of the future, how American policy and foreign policy is gonna play in that and uh, what is the reality versus the aspiration? And how should we navigate this path forward? You know, I think that's really going to be, the, because you know, yesterday night, I think, yesterday night, Greenpeace uh, projected, I'll send you a picture of it, projected on the, bill, the Department of Energy building, uh, a huge picture of Ernie Moniz, the Secretary of Energy during the second, uh, Obama administration, without a doubt, one of the most, you know, intellectual, hard headed thinking guys on energy policy, right? And he, he published something called the Green Real Deal instead of the Green New Deal. I mean, the Green New Deal is by any objective characteristic, a fantasy, a, you know, a fantasy of sort of unthinking. And, and Ernie Modi, Moniz is very instrumental in negotiating a lot of the technical aspects of the original deal with Iran, uh, fashioning US energy policy, looking at research and development for transition technology. He's being called out by the democratic left as being someone who took money from fossil fuel companies. Right? It's almost as if you're a politician from Texas and someone's criticizing you from taking money from an oil company. Well. I'm sorry, <laughs> now, Ernie Mooney's not from Texas, but if you're from Texas or, you know, the US is the world's largest oil producer, largest gas producer, fossil fuels are very important to American security and how we deal with them in this going forward uh, requires a lot of careful thinking and not uh, Yeah, and you'll agree with me that it also is going to involve some friction. There's gonna be absolutely. different it's viewpoints. Already, it's already starting, it's already starting. But I would say, there's nothing, I don't see anything in Biden's appoint, appointment so far that he's caving to the more fringe elements of the Democratic Party. I don't see that at all. I think he's right down the middle so far. So let's see what happens. Got to give him credit for that. Yeah, I think he's, uh, I think he knows what he's doing. I mean, one good thing about being an old guy is that you don't really worry too much about your future career. <laughs> yeah, well, you're making you and me both feel better about that then. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So one of the things is I thought we'd chat about today within the, this political context is um, what does it, how does he, you know, what, what do the data show us about the, the task ahead, right? And then um, what might it say, particularly in an era where we have divided government? By the way, I'm one of these uh, proponents who don't believe it's bad for Biden to have a Republican-controlled Senate and a somewhat more moderate uh, house. I mean, if you look at the recent election, uh, I, I think the pollsters really missed the mark. There's no doubt about it. They need to sort of own up that these models are not that good. Instead of gaining uh, 12 or 18, uh, 18 uh, seats in the house, the Democrats lost something like eight to 12. I don't know what the final number is yet. Uh, right now, we're going into the Georgia runoff elections. If those two seats, if one of those seats goes to a Republican, 
uh, they will have a, uh, a majority in the, in the Republican, uh, Republican. Well, under, under uh, Mitch McConnell, they'll just stop everything that Biden wants to I do. This is not a good result. Well, it depends on how you think about the more, uh, you know, Biden has got a lot of experience in the Senate and uh, there's going to be, uh, whatever you say about the election, 70 people didn't, 70 million people did not vote for Biden. So there has to be, so, and I think one thing about Biden is he's very likely, having spent all those years in the Senate, have an understanding that you know, ultimately you have to have a coalition or let's say, you have to have compromises to have the government go forward. I don't believe Mitch McConnell will do nothing. I think he will not be amenable to very radical proposals that will disrupt uh, his base or, or the national economy. So I, I actually, I'm not that, I think there's a lot of cooperative things that can be done. I'm basically an optimist by. I, I, I hope you're right about that, but I, I really am very worried about it because he has not been, demonstrated vision on any initiative so far. It's only been an uh, obstructionism. And that's where we are. And um, I don't know how you settle that out when one side really doesn't want to settle. Let me just say, let me just say, uh, let's take LNG. The US is now a, a third, the world's third largest LNG exporter in the world, right? I think you would be quite shocked if I told you most of the permits for where we are in the LNG world today, were issued during the Obama administration. And so I think, you know, this view that uh, there's no room for compromise on the relation, you know, on, on how we transition to the fuels of the future, how we deal with climate is just, uh, I, I disagree. There's things that can be done. There's going to be disagreements, major disagreements, if uh, the Democrats try to roll out extremely radical and in my view, counterproductive strategy. So I think they're... Uh... Well, I, yes, I, I, I we're on different sides on that. But let me say that, um, you know, the whole thing about, and this is a preface to your slides and the substance of your discussion, but, the, you know, the whole thing is, uh, we've had an emergent situation. We have an existential threat from climate change getting worse all the time. I know you, don't, you and I don't agree about that, but let me say that's got to be factored in. Uh, not only because it's politically, uh, you know, popular among a lot of people, um, but because it, it is an ex existential threat. Well, uh, but I think we need to remember it's not a U.S. problem. It's not a European problem. It's a global issue. So, oh, you bet. And if you don't, if you don't understand the motivations and the pressures, particularly in Asia, we're going to get through that right now. So maybe. What we should talk about is what is the reality? What do the models tell us? And you know, we see lots of models about uh, how easy it is or what we could do to transition to the fuels of the future, that we have these transformation technologies either to remove carbon from uh, fossil fuels or uh, transition to uh, these alternative fuels, which uh, are, uh, let's say, less damaging to uh, the natural environment or to at least into the emissions of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. So that's, uh, why don't we just start there? So as I said, we have a very big project underway. Uh, part of this is uh, with uh, some uh, folks in the federal government to try to evaluate not what is the best policy, but what is the most likely outcome? If you're a planner looking at certain strategic issues, uh, long-term uh, force projection, all these things that you might be interested, that think about the security of the United States at a more basic level, one thing you might want to do is, okay, if I step back from the aspirational models and I just look what's happening in the world, what can I know about what the world might look like in 20 years, 20 or 30 years, particularly if you're so I, one of the things I'd like to start with, why don't we start with our first slide here by George G. G. P. Box, a very well famous uh, uh, British statistician. And you know, in my business, people say, well, did you look at the model? The model shows we can do X or Y, right? And uh, he had a very interesting comment. He made this comment during the 30, where all models are wrong, but some are useful. 
And I thought we'd go through the, I thought we'd go through some of what the models show and more importantly, what, what the nature of the challenge is and why the challenge is so difficult and why alternative strategies are likely going to have to emerge over time. This is my theme tonight. Mm -hmm. so. And this is part of the challenge for President-elect Biden. Uh, and if you like the uh, secretary of the planet, uh, John Kerry. Or yeah, I love that secretary of the planet. planet. <laughs> Who could be more important, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you, okay. So here, I think this is really important. We may have talked about this in the past, but it's very important to understand. We have spent 20 years in the West, gobs of money on transitioning to the fuels of the future. We talk every day about how efficient solar is, how fantastic, uh, you know, uh, wind, and, you know, how things are just, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're making the transition uh, remarkably. So this is the end of, this is the end of uh, the beginning of 2019. Here. And if you look at this chart, this is what we call global primary energy consumption. And this is Vaclav Smil, who I know quite well. And he, he, he tried to get all the energy down to a common base number. And let's take a look at this chart for a minute. This is what the world consumes. And it consumes, and the first thing I want all the, you know, the listeners and uh, uh, participants tonight to look at is that there's not really a case in the modern history of the world from 1800 where we transitioned out of an old fuel. We just added new fuels. Right? That's what the history shows. You might not like the history, but that's what it shows. And that fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas, uh, while we've had shifts within fossil fuels towards gas and away from coal in parts of Europe and around the world, these are the dominant fuels for a reason. They have energy density, they're easily moved around, the liquid fuels can be put into pumps and they're just outstanding for transportation. Yes, and we have these other things, we have batteries and all these things. And notice even what we call traditional biomass, which in parts of the world is called firewood or uh, peat or whatever we do in parts of Africa. And he, keep in mind, this is a global problem. So this is the problem you have to deal with. It's very nice to talk what you're doing in California or in uh, Germany, but that's not, the, that's not the problem. The problem is the global, you know, the global challenge. And so- Well, you know, one, one thing that seems clear is that uh, this is driven by convenience. It's driven by, you know, uh, the way we've always done it. Uh, it, and it's driven certainly by economics. Absolutely. Um, and it's not driven by climate change. It's not no. driven by, you know, concern about the future of the planet. It is not driven by that. And, and I think it's because a good part of the planet, maybe most of the planet of, of humanity, uh, really doesn't buy in. They don't understand that. I don't think that, I think they know it's a problem. But if you don't, if you have a, a large amount of your population with low income, you need to have strategies. If you wanna stay in office, if you wanna keep a political uh, consensus together in your country, you can't price 80% of the population out of the energy market. They're just not gonna go for that. You're either yeah. gonna, so let's but, go. I mean, the whole thing about dealing with climate change requires sacrifice. It requires sacrifice by, by the whole world. And we're not getting that for the very reason you articulated and that is people are concerned with things that are closer to them, uh, where the next meal is coming from, what have you. So let's go to the next picture. So this is the other question I think is very, yeah. so actually this shows that in the US, people talk a lot about the massive improvements we've made in renewables and we have, but if you look at the primary consumption by energy source in the US, less than 4%, is wind and solar. Yes, we have other renewables. We have biomass, which has been around a while. We have ethanol, we have biofuels, we have, you know, we have wood, even wood. But I just don't want everyone to think that somehow these massive, there's a reason these massive investments have not 
really move the needle as far as you would believe reading the front page of your newspaper every day. So, or talking about Tesla or Leon Musk is one of the richest people in the world now. It's tr all these things are true, but you have to step back and look at the big picture. So uh -huh. th then let's look at the next one on, I think, uh, you know, emissions. Uh, yes. So here's the real story. If you don't have a transportation, a transformation program for Asia, and this is all about the Asia pivot, you can forget about making a massive dent in climate. Uh, the whole game is about Asia. Asia is where the growth is. Asia is where the growth of emissions are. Europe and the US, where our growth is, if you look at that, you know, we're, we're important. And if you go to the, you go to the next picture, I think we can see something. Yes, uh, this shows the this shows you what the most advanced, uh, most optimistic models are showing. And you see, even in these models, we still rely by 2040 or 2050 on fossil fuels. Now, maybe we can capture the carbon from a lot of those fossil fuels. And that's why I want to look at one more, which is uh, the emissions in Asia. If you look at the future emissions, and, to you, and if you took the OECD country, the Western OECD country, plus Japan, and you reduce their carbon emissions to zero, we would only get down to about 1995 emissions. The future of climate control, to the extent it's related to carbon emissions, lies in Asia. Without a plan for Asia, what we're doing in the West is only going to have a minimal impact. And when we talk about Asia, we've talked about this before. Uh, really, the wild card is China and then the rest of India, then India and the rest of the South Asian countries. And so any program going forward is going to have to engage the Asians in the strategies which are cost effective and frankly, you know, uh, uh, attractive enough that they're willing to make the commitments long-term. And I, I think without that, uh, we're in a lot of trouble. And then finally, let's take a look at how how very, how much uncertainty we have. This, this is, I think, fascinating. These are all the major uh, sort of economic energy models that have been run in recent years. And I want you to see here that coal, the uncertainty on the future of coal is just massive. We don't really have a consensus yet on what's going to happen to coal demand. And really, that's where the that's where the biggest opportunity is to reduce carbon emissions. Well, isn't, isn't, aren't those lines indicating that there's going to be a reduced demand for coal? Yes, but look at the difference. I would say the, uh, the uh, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, I would say that the difference in the models though are really stunning and the, and if you look at the IEEJ, which is the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, who is one of the few groups there that has detailed knowledge of Asia, they see, they see coal, uh, uh, coal continue in Asia. Now, what's interesting about the Energy Information Agency, their increase in coal from 2040 to 50 may not make sense, but embedded in their model is some breakthrough technology to capture the carbon in coal. So, you know, you know, one of the I, these are all, um, you know, uh, analyses, uh, expectations, predictions yeah. based on s certain assumptions, of course, and that's what modeling is all about. And that's why, you know, that first quote that you, you raised about all models are wrong, yeah. but some are useful, uh, useful for advocacy, I think. But, you know, the, the problem is it doesn't fold in the possibility that AOC or others in the new Green Deal, they may not have what they want, but they might have some success. And Biden, you know, he'll be middle of the road, but he'll be looking for a greener future, to satisfy, you know, his own sensibilities, but also, you know, the, the, the political progressive, you know, crowd that wants him to turn to green. And so, you know, that's, that's not really in these charts. And the, right. the question is, and, and this is the title question of the show, right. what, is he going to do? What should he do? How is he going to affect these charts? So 
I'm going to start off with a little story. Shortly after it became apparent that uh, uh, former Vice President Biden would become the new president, he got a call from uh, Prime Minister of Canada, Trudeau, congratulating him. And then Trudeau raised the issue of the Keystone XL pipeline which is still going through regulatory struggles and stuff. And which I believe Biden wrote on, wrote, uh, uh, Biden uh, uh, announced, or at least on the, the Republican, I mean, the Democratic platform that they were opposed to the Keystone Pipeline. The Keystone Pipeline brings uh, crude oil from the, uh, the, the heavy oil fields out of Alberta into the United States. It's part of the North American production and a distribution platform for crude oil. It's very important to Canada. Canada, in fact, you could argue, shut down all their coal facilities to make room for that in some kind of climate uh, view of the future. And I was told by a very high placed Canadian that Vice President, you know, President elect Biden said, Look, I will look at it. I will look at it. And so here is an administration coming out. The first thing they're worried about is alliance uh, cohesion. One of our most important allies calls up and said, you know, let's not forget about that Keystone problem. So this whole administration is going to have to balance a lot of very tough competing interests. And energy security, at least in the next 20 years, the ability of us to export and to be a net exporter of petroleum products is going to be a key feature. How he resolves that with the more, let's say, radical or, or aggressive elements of the Democratic Party is going to be the key to his future in my mind. And I think there is a pathway in which he puts a, we put a lot more money into research and development. We spend a lot more effort in trying to find a path forward. On the other hand, we don't blow up what we have and that we keep in mind that our allies also have mixed obligation and mixed goals. Security of the existing energy mix at the same time they want to begin to transition to the fuels of the future. Well, he said he was going to uh, rejoin the Paris Accords uh, on day one. This is not as easy as it sounds because you have to demonstrate commitment to reduce greenhouse gases, you know, below a certain percentage. and. And you have to put uh, institutional structures in place uh, to do that, uh, which we do not have in place. Keep and so the, the pro he's going to be stuck with the problem. It's very nice to have aspirations, but you have to follow through. Uh, it's very nice to please your allies, uh, but you have to follow through. We right, he has right. to put his money where his mouth is. Keep in mind, keep in mind that the U.S. never signed the Kyoto Protocol, but of all the prospective and members the Kyoto Protocol, the U.S. exceeded all the targets by a wide margin. And we did that because we had a massive uh, surplus of natural gas, and we were able to back out coal with cheap natural gas. So uh, uh, this is a very complex problem. And, some of, and how we transition and how we, we deal with it is going to be critical going forward. You know, for all the complexity, though, Lou, um, he's still got to keep keep his eye on the ball, whatever the ball is. He's still got to keep you know uh, keep his eye on the horizon in terms of aspiration to get there, and not be and not be stuck in the details, not be stuck in the complexities you talk about. So that's why I want to ask you one question finally uh, here in this discussion. Let's let's make you a member of his cabinet for a minute. Uh, let's make you the energy man. <laughs> but what, what is your recommendation for how he can handle this? What is the goal? What is that, you know, undying vision out there that he should be looking to? And how should he deal with, with all of these issues that come and hang on him, uh, which we expect uh, on energy as he goes forward? So, you know, if you were a member of the Academy, you also would be a political person. And so you would, you would think about you know, you've got elections. We, we, we had that. We had that being political people. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we ha we've had a hint now that maybe they won't. Maybe they'll be, you know, uh, altruistic. Maybe they'll be thinking of the country in general rather than politics. Well, I, I got I, my I, fingers crossed on that. I, I maybe lived in Washington too long. So the, the point is, is that 
the strategy, if I, first, I, I don't think anyone's going to be asking me for my opinion, but I would just say the strategy would be, uh, you have this great endowment of natural gas in the U.S. Don't do anything. It's a great transformational fuel, possibly a bridge fuel. And the first thing you want to know, it's very important for politics in Pennsylvania and Texas, places where you want to keep a coalition together. Uh, you've got uh, uh, midterm elections coming in 2022. So you want to make progress on climate, but you don't want it to be counterproductive. So in the early years, focus on technology development, on research, on engaging your allies, on getting on the gradient, but stay away from mandates, uh, strategies which really uh, destroy uh, a lot of existing uh, industries before their era of decline is fully in place. And, uh, you know, try to build on that going forward. Yeah, well, you've talked about, um, you know, the economics of it and the politics of it, but what about the, you know, aspirational goals for, you know, for the humanity, for the planet? What, what vision should he have there? Well, I think the, you know, the, there is a technocratic solution to that, a way to think about that. And that's some combination, adaptation and uh, getting on the, uh, you know, trying to find, a, a, trying to open up the system so that there can be exploration of the fuels of the, lock us into one strategy, right? We need policies which are robust against uncertainty. And there's a lot of uncertainty, including a certainty on the damage function for climate. And if, if you have a commitment to say, we know the answer and we're gonna go all in for wind and we're gonna forget about, that's a huge mistake because we have a whole history, I should say, a whole history, you know, the US spent, I don't know, one and a half billion dollars on a hydrogen car in the Bush administration. We spent a fortune on the Clint, on the Clinch River uh, reactor when we thought a nuclear power would be too cheap to meter. So we have a lot of experience out there. And one of the things we really need to understand is it's not the government mandated programs don't always work that way. Oh, true. Yeah. But a part of it is follow through. And I wanted to ask you one last thing. Yeah. Now, don't you think that in energy and, and other issues as well, but in energy, it's a matter of um, advocating, and it's a matter of educating, and more than anything, it's a matter of leadership. It's a matter of saying, I have considered this, and I've talked to the best and the brightest. This is the way we're gonna go. This is my judgment on it. You elected me to, to lead you, and I'm going to lead you down this direction. And sure, I'll, you know, I'll deal with issues, and I'll try to satisfy all the people I can satisfy, but at the end of the day, this is the direction. That's leadership. Uh, the buck stops here, you know? But now, I, I, I think we have to factor that in, don't you? Sure, that's very reasonable. But once again, <laughs> we have a lot of history of government failure as well as some success, right? And uh, so any strategy should, as I said, should directly address the uncertainty. He should provide that leadership, but he should have a sense that the strategies undertaking has some sustainability over time. Yeah, that's the magic word. There's so much more to talk about, Lou. I mean, we, you know, you touched for a moment there on nuclear energy. I don't think that's over. Um, nope. that, that may be a, an important piece going forward. And, and this is like, a, it's a whole reevaluation, a moment of reevaluation. I really look forward to our discussions going forward because all these issues, you know, all these possibilities are worth discussing. So let's, can we do this again in a couple of weeks then, Lou? Absolutely, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm <laughs> Please don't. Please stay at home as much as you can, even including on Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. Have a happy Thanksgiving to you and everyone at ThinkTech and all my friends in Hawaii. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. It's so nice to talk to you. Take care, be well. Aloha.